So let's assume that today you get an acceptance letter and you've gotten into the college of your dreams, right? Months of hard work, acing every test you've ever given has finally paid off and you're ready to go. And then the biggest hurdle often is paying the fee, right? And so the time has come to pay the fee and you realize, you know, I can take a student loan, so let me just apply for one. You get together all your papers, you apply for a loan, but it's rejected, right? So if this was 1995, you could have done one of many things. You could have rechecked your paperwork, you know, maybe your address was wrong, or you asked for the wrong amount of money, right? You can appeal to the loan officer and say, you know, what did you, wh why did you do this? Like, can you please tell me why this happened? If you thought the loan officer didn't like you, you could say, okay, I'm going to try another loan officer. I'm going to appeal this, right? In today's world, the scenario is a little different. Um, it's very likely that an artificial intelligence system is making that decision about whether you get the loan or not. It's also likely that you didn't put together 10 papers. All you did was logged into your Facebook or gave them your Facebook account, right? Or you gave them your email address, your phone number, and you told them, I want X amount of money. The problem is that you can't know for sure why it was rejected, right? Why your application was rejected. It could be that the algorithm found that your second name corresponds with a community that historically has not been socioeconomically strong. So past data says that this community is not credit worthy. So your second name is the reason that it was rejected. Or you're a woman, and I see many of us here, uh, which is great. You're a woman and the data suggests that women haven't had access to financial services. So past data reflects that women are not credit worthy and your loan is rejected. I'm trying to make two points here. A, you don't know why your loan was rejected. And B, there's not much you can do about it. Right? So this is just one example of how artificial intelligence affects you. And it actually affects you in much more mundane ways, in much more continuous ways than we already realize. So it changes the way we live. Um, home assistants like Alexa, right? We ask them what the temperature is outside and all sorts of other questions. Your Facebook news feed is fueled by AI. Um, I couldn't have reached here today if it wasn't for Google Maps because I got lost twice. And it also decides who you date, who you marry, right? So it affects every aspect of your life. Um, and also in consequential ways. So AI systems now decide whether you get a particular job or not. HR departments in many companies now, you are, now use artificial intelligence systems to decide who is the better job candidate. It's also used in policing. Um, I read this morning that Delhi police has been using facial recognition um, as a, on a pilot basis to ensure that they can identify people in a crowd. Right? Delhi police also has a system of predictive policing which is that you look at past data on crimes to determine where future crimes will probably occur and use resources accordingly, right? And police um, and law enforcement agencies around the world, not just Delhi, use this. So AI is everywhere, right? And so before I go any further, let's talk a little bit about what AI actually is. So artificial intelligence is the ability of computers to reflect intelligence to reflect something close to human intelligence. And the chances are you've heard about machine learning, which is actually the most popular technique of artificial intelligence. What it does is it uses a lot of data to figure out patterns within that data and to come up with models of process, right? So for example, I could write a machine learning algorithm to figure out what pictures are pictures of dogs and pictures of cats. I would feed it a lot of data. Can you hear me? Yeah, sorry. I would feed it a lot of data and it would come up with pattern and it would have a model by which it can identify which is a dog and which is a cat. Um, and the chances are that if you've read about artificial intelligence in newspapers or you know on Facebook or anything. You've also been fed this idea that it's going to be the last thing we ever invent and super intelligence is going to kill us, right? Um, I think this misses the point of artificial intelligence. The point of artificial intelligence is not that it's going to kill us 50 years from now, it's that it's already shaping our lives, your life and mine, today. 
And I want to focus on two extremely important things that I think everyone should know about artificial intelligence, regardless of your interest in technology, regardless of what space you occupy in society, regardless of whether you think you're never going to have to apply for a loan or not. Um, and the first one is machine learning is biased, right? So research from around the world has indicated that machine learning works better for some people and doesn't work as well for others. So facial recognition systems, for example, work better for people with light skin as opposed to people with dark skin. It works better for men as opposed to working for women. Um, there's, it's more than just loans as well. Uh, Google's uh, face, um, facial recognition system a couple of years ago mistook an African-American woman for a gorilla, right? And the reason is not because you know, it was something that they wanted to do, it's because they didn't feed enough data about African-American people to that particular algorithm, right? So that is the part of human bias. A lot of artificial intelligence depends on the human who is in the room who makes that system. The human decides what data the algorithm is fed. The human decides what the algorithm will look for. The human decides why it is used and where it's used, right? So the first thing is human bias. But the second is human legacy. Now, um, Amazon, I think earlier this year, said that they had tried to use artificial intelligence for hiring, but they found that that system discriminated against women. And they found that even if the word woman was on a man's resume, it would be put to the bottom of the pile. Now, that isn't necessarily human bias. You could say that all successful applicants in the past 20 years were fed to the, to the system to find patterns. But maybe sometimes what is accurate is not always what is desirable, right? Women could be discriminated against in the workplace because of many reasons. Maybe it was in a place where women weren't even allowed to work till 10 years ago or 12 years ago. So it's our legacy that catches up with us. So it's not always that bias is intentional. It is often actually unintentional. And human legacy uh, represents something that we don't necessarily want to cement into the future. We don't necessarily want technical systems that have an impact on our lives to take the worst parts of human history and then reinforce them, right? So the development of machine learning systems is social and it's political by its very definition. It has ethical choices at every point, not just at the outcome, but how you design it, who you're designing for, whether the question you're asking the system to solve is a good question in the first place. And most importantly, it's about all of us. Right, we've all walked down the road. If you walk down a road in Delhi, this is about you because your face is somewhere in a facial recognition system and your data is sitting somewhere and can be used in any number of ways. The second thing I wanted to talk about was the cost of efficiency. So now, when you think technology, it's likely that you think efficiency, right? Um, by saving your credit card number on Swiggy, you don't have to enter your details every single time. You save your location and you don't have to constantly say your flat and door number. It's efficient, right? It makes your life easier. But the cost of that efficiency is very high and the problem is that it's also invisible. So what you see is not what you get. Let me give you a couple of examples. So facial recognition at airports. Um, Hyderabad and Bangalore already have the option of scanning your face at an airport instead of having to worry about standing in line for the boarding pass, right? Seems like a great idea. You're just going to the airport, nobody likes standing in line, nobody likes that annoying wait before immigration and you're looking at whether the immigration officer is nice or not and you're trying to shift lines and things like that. It's just easier if you scan your face and you walk through. So that's what you see, right? You see efficiency. What do you get? you get a system that knows your every move at the airport. It knows what your face looks like. Your face is probably the most intimate information that you can know about yourself, that you have about yourself, your biometric information of what your iris looks like, what the space is between your eyes, you know, all sorts of measurements about your face. That is something you cannot reasonably change, right? But that information is sitting with someone and you don't exactly know who, right? You, like if I ask you, do you know what your airport information uh, goes through, do you know who it's sitting with? I'm guessing the answer is no, right? Um, that system knows what you look like when you're happy, when you're nervous, it knows what coffee you bought, right? It's a system of surveillance that you're buying into because you don't want to stand in line, right? That's what you get. What do you lose? 
you lose control over intimate data about yourself. In the absence of data protection, that information can be shared with any number of people. Right? It can be shared for any purpose. It can be shared to give restaurants who like people who buy coffees at airports because it indicates that you're willing to spend money on food and you may get a free coupon. That's great. It could also be used to store your face and check if you went to X protest. It can be used to identify your face in a crowd and it's not always the government or state agencies, right? In the absence of data protection, it can be private players as well. Let's take another example. So social media, you see everyone getting married or having children or, you know, um, cat videos maybe. Um, and you see a lot of interesting information that keeps you engaged, right? We've all had that moment where you're like, I'm going to go on Facebook for five minutes and then it's one hour later and you haven't studied in your exams tomorrow. So that's what you see. You see an interesting platform with lots of engaging content, right? And it's entertaining, so why wouldn't you like it? What you get is a system that is not optimizing for your interest. Facebook doesn't care what you get out of your content, right? Um, it doesn't really care about whether the content makes you happy, whether you're getting a good diet of information, whether you know the latest news. It cares about how much time you're spending on the platform. And because it cares about how much time you're spending on the platform and because human nature is a little messed up, we like things that are sensational, right? We like things that are polarizing. We like outrageous news. Donald Trump is interesting because he's outrageous in so many ways to so many people, right? So you get a system that is optimizing and profiting through your time, but what do you lose, right? That could be one of the questions that you have. You lose your ability to form opinions without it being colored by a program. You lose, like Cambridge Analytica, a lot of people thought was a horrible, you know, um, egregious sort of use of Facebook, but actually Cambridge Analytica was proof that Facebook's business model works. It was proof that you can use data to engineer how people think and how they feel and how they interact with society. By using Facebook, we spend that much time and every minute you spend on Facebook, you're giving them details about what you like, what are the other sites that are open at the same time, who your friends are, do you chat with people on Facebook or not? And all of this adds to their ability to keep you on the platform. And maybe I'll stop here for a while. Um, so I'm hoping that by this point, there are two points that are clear to you, right? The first is that it's bias, but not just human bias. It's not a question of de-biasing a machine learning system. It's about questioning humanity's legacy up until now. And it's understanding that the world from which we're building machine learning models is messy, it's unfair, it's not always great. And the second is that what you see is not what you get. So next time you're thinking of technology as efficiency and you don't want to enter your address, Right? I'm hoping that you think through what um, that sort of engagement means and what you actually get, and what you actually lose. And I wanted to leave you with four main points. Right? The first is, do we want the future to look like the past? Right? So machine learning uses data from the past as ground truth for what should happen in the future. So I'm using machine learning to m ensure I get the best candidates. So I assume I've had the best candidates in the past. I'm using machine learning to understand what crime will happen next. I'm assuming that all the crime reporting in the past has been completely accurate and is free from human bias, is free from institutional bias. And we have to ask ourselves, do we really want to repeat the mistakes that we've made? Right? Do we really want to cement uncomfortable parts of society into technology? The second is that we tend also to think of technology as something that cures something or helps something or makes it faster or quicker, right? And to be fair, it does in many, many ways. But what we need to focus our attention on is not what machine learning can do. It's not the killer robots. And I know a lot of smart people work on killer robots, but I'm still saying I don't think it's the killer robots that deserve our attention at this point. It's the limitations of current technologies that deserve our attention. How does this affect my ability to be a citizen with respect to a state? How does it affect my ability as a consumer? Um, and instead of focusing on unfulfilled promises, we should look at where the technology is right now. Right? It's not a silver bullet. It doesn't solve all our problems. It cannot save us. Um, the third is that because it's a relatively 
um, fashionable technology at this point. There are a lot of very, very bright people working on this. So you have anthropologists, you have designers, you have lawyers like myself, you have engineers, of course, social scientists, you have philosophers, um, you have social scientists. Those bright lines for what machine learning should and shouldn't do and how it should be designed needs to be drawn by everyone. Right, right now, it's usually an engineer somewhere in Silicon Valley that's changing slowly yet surely. Um, it's usually men. It's usually people from a certain socioeconomic background because th those are the only people who have access to computer science degrees. Right? But we need machine learning to be ground up. We need, ev like it's crucial for all of us to be writing where those bright lines stand or not. And the last point, I mean, if you take one thing from this talk, I'm hoping that you, you take the fact that AI needs your healthy skepticism. And I say healthy skepticism because while my talk so far has focused on what AI is bad at, it's, the truth is it, it can also be great for some things and for some applications, but we need a healthy skepticism towards what the solutions are. Understand the implications that are invisible and visible. Understand what inclusion and exclusion into technical systems mean. And understand that technology is not magic. Um, and so, yeah, we, we can't afford to have a blind spot when it comes to a technology that affects every minute of your day. Thank you.